Thank you. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen. I appreciate Dan leading us in that. It's very fitting. I usually ask people when I'm around people that go to other churches, especially the large churches, multiple services, growing churches, I ask them, do, does your pastor deal with government issues? Does he deal with politics? Never. So far, I haven't found any of them that do. But yet, I believe we're called to be an ecclesia, which is a legislative body that's supposed to carry an impact into the uh, realms of our influence, into our states, our nations, our cities. And uh, we're supposed to uh, influence the outcome of them with the authority that Jesus gave us. So, and you, you know about that. I've taught about that. But not many are doing it. They're avoiding the hard issues that bring controversy because not everybody understands or agrees. When you come, I've been at the table with other pastors, and uh, we have had our Coke and our sandwiches and our chips, and we have avoided talks about, talk about religion and politics because pastors don't even agree. And because we were there to fellowship, develop unity. So we can't even agree on who's supposed to be president. What do you mean, unity? Can we talk about it at least? And if we talk about it, then we find out that not everybody has a biblical worldview. So, um, but I won't go there. Um, we all have bless me scriptures, but we don't have a biblical worldview. And uh, there's a difference. Um, I want to say this, this morning too, for those of you that haven't heard, and if you haven't, get on some of our uh, opportunities for communication I, I, Joe's and Dan brings it up a lot of times you can get texts and emails and things like that but uh, our brother Ken Lindsay went to uh, he got promoted to the great cloud of witnesses he's a warrior and um, Dan and I got in and drove home from New Orleans uh, Wednesday evening and got to, got to pray for him and see him and then uh, Thursday morning I got there two minutes before his heart stopped, and uh, so um, was with him in those. Uh, the, uh, and he was he had already, you know, gone to be with the Lord. I was with Rosellen and Shannon, and uh, their his memorial service will be Saturday. And so the battle rages, and uh, I hate cancer, I hate disease, I hate infirmities. I, I believe still it was premature, and we contend for healing and, and in every way. And I thank God for doctors and nurses and hospitals and those that battle that kind of thing and, um, and uh, appreciate, appreciate them. But we just speak a blessing on to Roselle and Shannon that the uh, presence of God, the encouragement of the Lord, will just uh, cocoon them and keep them in this stressful time of making decisions and, and, and having to work out details and uh, walk through such uh, trauma and we just bless them uh, in Jesus name and his uh, memorial service will be here at 11 to 1 on Saturday so if you want to sorry what visitation 11 to 1 service at 1 so if you can make that and you want to honor Ken we're going to honor his life and uh, it was an honor to know him and uh, he was a military man and so he and I had things in common the way we viewed things kind of like chop chop just do it <laughs> and so we didn't I, I miss him miss him but um, also um, just my take on being in Washington DC very quickly um, I had a, an, just an overall um, general take on it it's a place of great intensity of um, activity and I had a very real sense that everyone there is driven and nobody's there by accident nobody's there be, uh, there's tourists there and you can tell who they are and um, but everybody that's there has an agenda has an angle and is there to get something done and we were no different we were on a mission we were, had an assignment, and we were in those hallways with those just like us, and uh, theirs was to get what they wanted established and, and pull others into their side and their way of thinking, and ours was to declare Jesus as Lord, and that um, there, there were uh, 
witches, there's warlocks, there's protesters, there's police, there's media, and it's all going on. It's like an anthill. It's one of probably the most intense places in the world because it's one of the most powerful places in the world. And it, as I came out, and Dan, maybe you experienced this, it took me a while to just, it drained me. But, uh, but we're ready to go back if we have to and we, if we need to. And we'll go in there with our spiritual guns blazing and not back up because that's our capital. It belongs to our country and this nation is one nation under God and it has a destiny in God. And on our watch, in our generation, we're not going to be the ones that lose it, lose religious liberty, lose freedom of speech, lose things that were standard and, and expected to be maintained and retained by uh, each generation. So <clears throat> um, it, it was an honor to be sent there, and, uh, and we felt uh, that there were some good things accomplished, and the battle still rages. We were sent out of what I believe this place is a kingdom community, and I use that term to uh, describe what I'm going to speak about again today. I talked about it last Sunday. But it's something that... Um, was developed out of what the Lord said in uh, Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19, when he said, uh, Peter, upon this rock I will build my ecclesia, my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I give you the keys of the kingdom, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And um, we, we normally, it's, it's a strange statement because gates are normally passive. But the meaning in those days were the gates of, of, um, of Hades. Hades was the underworld. It was the, uh, it was the place of death. And so he said the, those that have authority in the place of death are not going to prevail against this community of legislators that I build upon a rock that, Peter, you represented when you went uh, into a place where you uh, got your revelation and, your initi and, and the initiative and the direction from heaven, and you spoke it. You said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, Upon that kind of people, those that, those that care, uh, those that make it their priority, what it is that King Jesus is saying for the moment, that's where I'm going to build my ecclesia. Because it really matters that we're not just saying things, but we're saying what he's saying in the moment and in the situation. That's what really matters. That's where the authority comes from. So um, the nucleus of people that had made the words of King Jesus their priority, the Scripture tells us in Acts through Dr. Luke that it was about 120 people. And they were physically gathered together in the upper room, and it says that Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to them, spoke to them about things pertaining to the kingdom. That's why I want to call it a kingdom community. His emphasis before he went away, which would be your most important things to say, had to do with the kingdom. And so out of that 40 days with him, then they watched him ascend. They went back to that upper room. And those that had made it their priority to do what he said, they waited there because he said to wait there. And they waited 10 days. This is people not filled with the Holy Spirit, not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but, but people who were still um, understanding that what Jesus said is the most important thing, and we're going to do it. And then 120 people were there when the Holy Spirit came in like a mighty rushing wind. He baptized them in himself. It altered their um, outlook, uh, in some ways their personality. Peter, who had denied Jesus three times out of fear, stood up and began to preach out of this I event known as the day of Pentecost. That nucleus of people then, Dr. Luke in the book of Acts tells us, uh, the Lord added to it, multiplied it, and expanded it, and scattered it across the earth with the DNA that the priority is to hear and obey King Jesus. That was their DNA. It never was, well, why don't you just figure out what to do and God gave you a, a, a rational mind. God gave you reasoning, the ability to think. Yes, thank God for that. But all of that is submitted to and uh, laid at the feet of Jesus. And he says, I have also empowered you, in, in, invested in you, and filled you with the Holy Spirit who will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
And so uh, it becomes our goal is to, yes, I understand all these are the facts, and this is the situation, but what is it you're saying? And that's what I want to hear, and that's what I want to do. That's what I want to uh, override my opinions and my reasoning. And, um, and so, we're, we're, so uh, Paul teaches that we need a renewed mind. And that renewed mind becomes a tool of the Holy Spirit rather than a resistance to the Holy Spirit. The unrenewed mind, he said, is constantly at enmity to God. It's, it's always hostile to God's will. But the renewed mind becomes a con confirmation of God's will. The Holy Spirit says, do this, and the renewed mind begins to think of scriptures that back it up. The renewed mind begins to praise him in the midst of it. Bill Johnson says, when you see the impossible and think it's logical you're dealing with a renewed mind so uh, that's where we're headed that's where we're going that's our goal the apostle Paul talks to one of, writes a letter to one of these ecclesia outposts located in the city of Ephesus and by his letter he broadcasts into our time what is the will of God and he says this in Ephesians 4 1 through 3 I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. I'm pleading with you, he says. Walk worthy of the calling. Walk, you're, you're, do what is in your DNA. This is who you are. Walk worthy of your calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul said that doing community is not easy. But it's so essential that he said, I plead with you all to endeavor, to make every effort, to labor, to develop, and keep a consistent life-giving connection to the spiritual body of Christ. You know, you would think, well, we're all Christians. We ought all to just be happy together. You know, wonderful to be together, and we love each other, and we're all just Christians. Hallelujah. Everything, when you're all Christians, everything goes smooth and wonderful, and you relate well because you're all Christians, you know. And, you know, how, how quick did that um, delusion, how quick did that go away after you got saved? I got saved when I was in my 20s, began to relate to other Christians, and, and there was a, a year, year and a half, I think, before I was in involved in a, in a church situation that had anybody speaking into my life pastorally but um, which I needed that time was just me Jesus and the Bible it helped me be sane then when I stepped into a church environment and realized that uh, we're all Christians but we're not all at a, um, a mature state of being including myself and so uh, you, you realize there's opportunities for hurts for offenses for uh, misunderstandings, miscommunication. But it was God's idea to set up community. It says in Psalm 68, verse 6, God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. In other words, you were over here bound in the, uh, under the, the uh, tentacles of the devil and in the uh, kingdom of darkness and he set you free translated you into the kingdom of light and he put you in a place of prosperity of body soul and spirit and every other way and he uh he says and and out of that then I've, I've i've connected you to my family to god's family but those that resist that will dwell in a dry land they won't experience the benefits of being set in a uh the family of god the story of the bible is creation, separation, redemption, reconciliation, restoration, and it doesn't stop there, and kingdom community. When we stop with our focus, just it's me and God, me and Jesus, we don't complete the kingdom gospel. Because the kingdom gospel takes you from being reconciled to God to reconciled to each other and to it being walked out in a community environment. Over the years, I've had to make some hard choices uh, to stay connected in community situations. And 
those choices didn't always pay off immediately. But I'm experiencing benefits today of choices I made years ago not to disconnect and to stay in a place and in an environment where his benefits could flow into my life. Many avoid being involved in community because it, involve, because it requires being involved with imperfect people. When God said the solitary in a family, he didn't say the family didn't have issues. But the benefits of being set in a family and connecting, the benefits override or outweigh the issues, the, the, the problems that will be caused by the issues. You know the old saying, you know, the, the, if the church was perfect, as soon as you joined it, it's not perfect anymore. That's a, that's a, 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 even if you could find a perfect one. And obviously there's not. And everybody has a bad or a sad church story. You know, if you've been around very long, if you've been saved very long, if you've been uh, uh, connected anywhere to any kind of a church or ministry, but the effort you make to stay connected will pay, pay off through your, throughout your future. And I'm talking about connected where the Lord wants you to be connected, not in some dry, dead, um, nothing's for today, it's all for the future, it's all for the past, but you don't have anything coming at you today, no gifts of the Spirit, no, no uh, promises are fulfilled in, in, in this day, but you know they shove it either to the future or they shove it to the past. I'm talking about being in a, a life-giving body. And, and yes, we're imperfect, but there are some basic things we've got to have right that won't rob people of their destiny. I can handle not everything agreeing with my doctrine, but if it robs people of their destiny or sends them to hell, I got a problem, okay? And we ought to have a problem with that. And there's, there's people in high places preaching things that, that do rob people of their destiny, that, do, that it does send people to hell. So we have to stand against that. We have to uh, hate that kind of thing. So uh, the, the, in the context of community, here's what I want to focus on and it's one of the challenges uh, that we have in church in a church the church environment is the context of community is the context where God um, allows grace to be imparted for us to grow up man I'm so spiritual when I'm alone when I get around Angie, I just, I don't know what the deal is, you know. I just, she robs me of my spirituality because she makes me so mad, you know. And it's her fault. <laughs> I know I can say that about Angie because it's, it's, it's a joke. I understand. <laughs> you'll, have to, you'll have to talk that one out when you get home, Jamie. That was where you, you didn't need to say the amen right there. <laughs> So it's in the context of community. Proverbs 18, verse 1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. It is unwise in every way to avoid, to reject, to neglect, to refuse to be connected in community because of the benefits and because of the grace that flows in community to grow us up. The biggest problem in the church is not the devil. It's the immature, carnal-thinking Christian. It's, it's immaturity. It's refusal to grow up. Paul looked back uh, in, in his uh, letter to the Corinthians. He said, he said, you're babes in Christ, but, and there's no problem with being babes in Christ, except you shouldn't be anymore. He said, you're in strife, and you're separated and divided over who's your leader. And, uh, and, he's, and, and how many of us know that that goes on today? And, and because of that, you're... You're trapped in, an, in a carnal mindset, a carnality that is, is only seen for those that are yet babes. So there's a, there's, a, there's a time when we are expected to grow up and God has set us in a community to facilitate that and to, uh, to release a grace for that. Have you ever noticed that it's only or mainly the family that's concerned when someone seems not to be able to grow up. You go to a restaurant, and a 30-year-old acts like a 3-year-old. 
If they get their money, they're okay with it. They're just there to give him food and, and to get the money. A true family goes, there's something wrong here, son. You're supposed to be eating with a fork, not your hand. You, know, you don't throw food at a 30-year-old because you're having a fit in the restaurant. But many churches are like restaurants. As long as they get their tithe, as long as they get their money, you can act like you want to act, and I'm not going to address it. I'm not going to hold you accountable. You can be in leadership, and you can lie. Well, David, why are you making this stuff up? I'm not making it up. I didn't read that in a book somewhere. You can... Um, manipulate and scheme and rob other people as long as you tithe as long as you keep coming and filling those seats but in a family you go wait a minute that's not right you can't do that and claim whatever you're claiming you've got to grow up and so families care Functional families care about whether you're growing up or not. And so they, uh, a functional family wants you connected. They want you connected in community because only in community that's intimate enough do people really get to know what you're really like. And do you really get to express yourself as, as to your, your cares and your concerns? And is it even possible for another human being to embrace and listen to it and carry those kind of burdens? I can't carry the burdens of 200 people. Kayla and Dustin, when they sat behind me, I told them a couple of months ago, I said, when I ask you on Sunday morning when I say, how y'all doing? I said, that's your time where you have permission to lie to me. <laughs> say you're doing fine. Say everything's wonderful. And so they've been very faithful to obey me in that. And then they come to Dan for counseling, you know. But, and, like we all need to. But, but I don't have time for you to unload on me, especially on Sunday morning. I, I've, I've, I've been there where the guy grabs me on Sunday morning and he said, I had a problem last night, Saturday night. And he unloads this horrible sin. I'm going, I don't even have time to talk to you about it now, but could we talk about this another time would you tell me at another time you know I'm, I've got other things on my mind right now but in the smaller context there's people that care that have been walking with you that uh, care how you're doing that that can uh, express it that can take the time and can help shoulder the burdens that you're you're carrying um, by choosing to stay connected in a community you go against the current of our, of, of our present culture. Our present culture is, pray, is paying homage to anarchy, independence, I'm my own man. Uh, it, it borders on idiocy. I'm so much my own man, I'm a woman, and I'm still my own man. Guess what? In a family, a functional family, dad and mom gets to sit down and say, hey, listen, you were born my daughter and you're my daughter and I'm not changing what I call you. I'm not going to call you a man's name because you think now you're a man. We'll help you walk through that, work through that, but that's not acceptable. But in the culture we live in now, that's intolerant, that's cruel, that's harsh, that's mean, and, uh, and we're going to burn your business down because of it because we're the victims. I tell you, we live, we live in a crazy day. And you choosing to stay connected where you can get input and you can receive instruction and you can receive valuable um, influence is going against our culture. But church, the, we were always meant to be a subculture. We were always meant to be different than the culture around us. We were supposed to be the salt and the light, not the same. So um, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. 
And all the elders go, yes, amen, hallelujah. But then he says, yes, all of you be submissive. Oh, okay. To one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. God has designed it so that a main way that grace flows is for there to be connection and, and receiving and giving in the context of community. I'm a, I fish, and, and those of you that fish know that a boat motor was designed to run smoothly and, and run cool in the uh, water that it's working in. And we're designed that there is a grace to function in community that keeps us from locking up in a certain stage of immaturity. There's a grace for it. Many Christians are locked up at some level in, in stages of immaturity because they chose, for whatever reason, to disconnect. And sometimes those reasons were good, but then sometimes there was opportunities to reconnect, and they said, no, I've done that before. Bought the T-shirt, got the video. I'm not going to do that. And so they never get out of, they never grow out of a level of immaturity, but they go to the Lord at 92, the same level of spiritual maturity in certain areas as they were at 22. It's awful quiet in here. <laughs> God's calling us out of immaturity. He's calling us into maturity. In community, I want to give you some benefits of uh, community. In community, we learn how to trust. And a lot of this relates to just your natural family. If you had a functional, healthy, natural family growing up and the, or you have children now, it relates. You know, this just crosses over into that. And many of us grew up without in a very dysfunctional family. And so it, it didn't relate. It doesn't relate. But the Lord has set us now in a family that's healthy and ruled by King Jesus and it's functional and it's, uh, it's supposed to be and it's where uh, we can receive the grace and the help and the love and, and, and grow up in an environment that is uh, conducive of that. So it's where we learn to trust someone that enough that we can let our walls down and let them see into our life enough to where they can have an influence on what we're really like. Somebody said, well, did you help Dan think straight about a certain issue? I said, I didn't know Dan thought that way because he never let his, he never, we, we rode together for six hours, but he never told me that he was thinking so weird <laughs> <laughs> because Dan was on his guard, see, had his walls up. You can do that. You can do it all day long. You can do it in this environment on Sunday morning. But when you say, I'm going to connect in a community, and you get around people, and you begin to say, hey, I trust that person. There's, you know, sometimes God puts a person in your life that it's not that they're more spiritual than anybody else. It's just their personality because of your past experience. Their personality doesn't threaten you. They're not more spiritual but he just loves you so much he gave you he put somebody in your life with a personality that you can open up to and i and you know people that say if you got a problem don't gossip bring it to the leadership they don't understand people because you need to bring it to somebody you trust and somebody that you can you're comfortable with and then i say make sure that person's mature enough and and they can bring it to the leadership if they deem it's necessary but don't um take it to someone else that's just as bothered by it as you are and doesn't have an answer so God does that for us so we learn how to trust in community we learn how to forgive in community listen to this take on this scripture Matthew 5 23 therefore if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you leave your gift there before before the altar and go your way first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift <clears throat> Jesus is uh, it's you can take you can get this out of that Jesus is saying your gift is wonderful I gave you your gift I love the way you sing I want you to sing but if you're functioning in your gift and you know that there's division and there's strife between you and a brother 
and there's a disconnect and you can do something about it or, or you should at least try to do something about it, then he said, your gift is not more important than that relationship. Step away from your gift long enough to pursue the repair of a relationship. So we learn how to forgive in the context of community. Strength comes from community. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the com companion of fools will be destroyed. Your marriage, your finances, your ministry do not need just your best. They need the best of the people God has put you in connection with. And in community, you can pull on that. People come and they say, we just want to be, uh, we want to see miracles, signs and wonders in our ministry and our lives. I said, where, where, where is your church membership? And they tell me, and I say, well, they don't believe in signs and wonders or miracles are for today. They go, yeah, yeah, but we never hardly go there. I said, but that's where you're connected, that they think you're a member of that family. And that's as far as the, the uh, devil's a legalist. Your paperwork says you're a member of that family. Your condition is connected to who you're connected to. And you can't say, I want a different condition, but I'm still connected to a source that doesn't allow it. So it's really important we live in a time where you really need to define your alignment. And you need to make sure it's, uh, you're aligned with the kind of, in the kind of stream that that's what you want to see in your life and your ministry and your family. So strength comes from community. Prayer covering comes from community. The great Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 6, verse 18 and 19, uh, he uh, exhorts the saints, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. He says, look, you, you uh, uh, supernatural kingdom community of Ephesus, I need your prayer covering. I need you to support me in, in prayer. And you support each other. You pray for each other. You cover each other. I'll never forget when Larry Lee was pastoring Church on the Rock in Rockwell, Texas. It grew into a massive church in just a few years, in three years. He was teaching on um, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer being a means of prayer and it grew and it prospered and but I was at a conference one time and he said this uh, when he was teaching he said the Lord has told me that the two the, the, of course my covenant with him he said but the other two covenants I cannot break is with my wife in this church a year later he left the church to go full time traveling ministry the church was turned over to someone else a year after that, he divorced his wife. A year after that, I don't know where he ended up. He was, he was ministering overseas, but he ended up fighting, and some of you might know, he was a blessing to my life, the, the, the message he brought uh, and how God used him. But uh, he ended up careening off into something he shouldn't have had to experience had he stayed under the prayer covering where God said, this is what you need, buddy as dynamic and as gifted as you are, you need these people to cover you in prayer. And you need your wife's prayers, and you need to stay protected that way. God speaks in community. God speaks to us a lot of times through other people. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. But he, but he does. And so when we're connected with people, when we're around people, it gives them the opportunity to come up and say, hey, I was praying for you the other day, and, and, and I just did this... Um, at 4 o'clock in the morning the other morning, and I hope their phone doesn't wake them up. I hope they have it on silent or something. But I texted them. I said, I was praying for you, and the Lord told me to tell you this. And, and uh, so because there's a connection there, I could do that. And so you give yourself more opportunity to get confirmation and to receive from others who know your life, know the calling on your life, and know a little bit about God's timing for your life, and because of your connection, they can say, you know, I, I do believe you're going to be a great preacher one day. But, you know, right now, your kids are small. You know, you've got family 
uh, uh, responsibility and, and going on the road right now, I don't just don't and, and where you're at with your family, I just don't think it's the right time. You can only get that in, in community. I think one of the dangers of the commissioning from ministries that are in Dallas and you're over here and they never see you is that they don't they can't bring that kind of adjustment. I could call Chuck Pierce right now on three or four people. He has no idea who they are, but they're commissioned through his ministry. That's okay because there is a release from that stream into someone's life, and you get blessed that way. But you've got to have connection somewhere in the body of Christ with other people who have got enough um, courage to say, hey, I don't care if you're, connect if you're commissioned by Chuck Pierce. You can't prophesy those kind of things over people who you're ruining their lives by giving them those kind of directions. I had someone who's a very, very strong prophet. They're not in here, but they said, I want you to come with me. I'm going to prophesy this over one of the ladies in our church several years ago. And he wanted me to, uh, you know, affirm that it was from God. He got partway into it, and I said, wait a minute. That's not God. You stop right there. And he got offended. He wanted me along for the show. He just wanted me along to agree. He didn't really want me to judge it. And he didn't come back. But I'm not going to stand aside and listen to somebody say something that's violating the will of God over somebody. And because I want to keep in good standing so I can get invited to preach somewhere, I'm going to stand there and listen to them say something that's out of order. And not, and not bring some, some input into that situation. So God speaks in community. Training happens in community. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.15, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. Fathers create an environment to where you can have mentors and instructors and teachers out the wazoo. <laughs> That's like a Brazilian. It's a whole lot. <clears throat> we have that here. You can, ha you can receive from the grace gift. You received from the grace gift of John Wilson last Wednesday night. You can receive from the grace gift of Hayes Patrick on Sunday morning. The other Sunday morning, I, I, I've never seen a service where things were so interwoven from the opening remarks to the closing ministry, interwoven and blessed by the Holy Spirit is when Hayes taught a couple Sunday mornings ago. That can go on in an environment where a father has created community. There's, there's security enough that different teachers and different mentors can affect your life if you'll allow them to. Ministry is birthed out of community. Acts 13.3 says, So after they had fasted and prayed, speaking of the church of Antioch, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And then it says, and, and being sent out by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy, them hearing the Holy Spirit uh, obeyed the Holy Spirit and sent out Paul and Barnabas. So it's important for us to have been sent, not just went. So that means you have, I've had people come and they say, you know, uh, I want to be sent. I feel God's called me to start a church, and I want to be sent out from another church because I, I see how important that is. I said, well, to be sent out, you have to be a part. In other words, you have to have had a connection, not just come in here and say, send me out. So I had one brother, he, um, he said, I'm supposed to um, minister this message, and um, I just need your blessing. And, and I said, okay, but, uh, you know, I don't know, if, I don't think you're ready to be minister a message. But he went out and went to a, a church of Christ in Clinton, and he walked in and he said, I have a message from the Lord. And he told the pastor a little bit of the message. And the pastor said, I don't think that's, uh, that you have a message for us today. He says, who are you and where are you from? He said, I'm so-and-so, and I'm from David Hurdle's church, Hope Fellowship. I said, why did you do that? <laughs> I didn't send you. You just went. And he said, I'm not, he said, you can't speak in this place today. He wasn't sent. He just went. And sometimes it's not that obvious or that dramatic. But oftentimes we take it upon ourselves to, um, to just go and do things without there being 
a community that says, yes, this is God. One more encouragement comes through community. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13 says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, all of the um, challenges and um, negatives that the social media can bring into our lives, isn't it wonderful that it can bring daily encouragement from friends who can connect in ways that you never could connect before. It can be used for, for good. And, um, and so we have to take the time to encourage you. And, you know, Bobby, you can come. The, um, I'm just going to say this real quick as I close. There are roadblocks to community, and some of those are, uh, several of those are, we have, uh, there, there's a roadblock if we have a resistance to feedback and instruction. And if we do, we have, to, we have to get it right to where we can uh, handle that. Uh, another one is we feel our issues are too embarrassing to make known to other people. We think we're the only ones with a problem like that. That's a lie. <clears throat> another one that resists community is a mindset that we need to make it on our own. And that's an American mindset. You know, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And... Uh, and uh, do it on your own. And that's not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is interrelationship. It's interdependent. And another one is there's a, there's a thing called an independent spirit. And um, an independent spirit uh, has trouble with long-term alignments. I didn't say associations. I said alignments because alignment means there's accountability involved. Association means you've just connected. You've got your name on the roll. But long-term alignments. A sp and then another one is a spirit of rejection. I don't know whether many of you know or no have known somebody or not, but sometimes people who are difficult to relate to, they're, they're battling with and they're, they're oppressed by a spirit of rejection. And the interesting thing about someone who's oppressed by a spirit of rejection is they will do things to get them rejected. You go, why don't you do the opposite? Because they don't, the, the spirit of rejection is not allowing them to. And so it's something that we have to break off and something we have to press to, through, but it's also something that as a community we have to have patience and kindness and, and uh, long-suffering and all those things Paul listed with people that they can get free so that they can relate. Why don't you stand with me and we'll close with a prayer. And I want to say this, we have to declare war on disconnect. Just make it very difficult. I'm not saying there's not times God asks you to break off a relationship or to, or, or to shut down a relationship, because sometimes they're toxic, and you do need to break off of it. But then there's other times we disconnect way too easy. And we haven't labored, and we haven't uh, endeavored, and we haven't uh, uh, made an effort to keep a relationship connected uh, one of the characteristics of the revival and reformation that we're all hungry for is God will restore severed relationships and if so and he will we need to be a people where he's restored we've allowed him to restore ours and we've allowed him to give us the skill set and the grace to help others restore theirs so we just want to pray that way. And I just ask you to repeat this, just a short prayer with me. And it goes like this, and you say this with me. Holy Spirit, if there is a disconnect that I have allowed to exist because I just don't want the accountability or the inconvenience or whatever the reason, I repent of that. And I renounce it. Now come and connect me into a kingdom community. Even as you did the 120 believers on the day of Pentecost. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said amen. Amen. Now if you don't know the Lord, please come. There will be a ministry team if you'll come down. Ministry team.